uh, I think what we'll do is we'll start out with a bit of a um, recap from what we did last time, and then we'll go through those ECGs that um, sent you as your homework. So let's give it a start. Okay, so just to recap of what we've going on here. So what we went through last time, we talked about uh, we talked about rate, we talked about regularity, we talked about axis, um, and so let's just go back through those things again. So rate. Um, when we're when we're looking at the heart rate, we can do it in a couple of different ways. We've got and we can look at the we can count the number of big squares between QRS complexes and divide 300 by the number of big squares. And that gives us a, a rough estimate of what's going on. Or we can count the number of QRS complexes in a given time period, such as five seconds, which would be 25 big squares and multiply that up. And the normal heart rates between 60 and 100. So a heart rate less than 60 is a bradycardia and a heart rate greater than 100 is a tachycardia. When we look at axis, we look at axis representing the average wave of depolarization throughout the ventricles. Um, so the easiest way to do that was to look at leads one and look at AVF. We know that our axis, if our zero degrees is going straight out eastwards on this on this plot here, um, and as we go clockwise, it's, we we become positive plus ninety. As we go um, as, as we as we go more up towards the north, we go as we go um, anti-clockwise, we go negative to minus ninety, and the normal axis is between minus thirty and plus ninety. So the normal axis would be positive if you're positive in the normal, the normal axis would be positive in one and AVF. A rightward axis would be if you're positive in AVF, but negative in, in, uh, in, in lead one. A leftward axis would be if you're positive in lead one, but negative in lead AVF. We talked about intervals. We talked about the PR interval. So it's time from the onset of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex. And that should be between three and five small squares or 120 to 200 milliseconds. We looked at the um, duration of the QRS complex, which would normally be less than three small squares. And we looked at the duration of the QT interval. So we talked about those as ways that we could uh, we could start um, we, we could start to approach the ECG. Now we're going to now now we've worked out how to measure rate and axis and intervals and regularity. We're now going to put those into context, and we're going to start looking at um, what's a normal heart rhythm and some and some common abnormalities of the heart rhythm using those things that we've learned to measure. So let's go through the homework first. Right, so um, I'm going to need a volunteer to talk through the first one. So talking through the things that we've um, talking through the things that we looked at last time. So the rate, the axis, um, the intervals, and the regularity. Um, who who wants to go first with the, with the first one? Someone's got to be brave. Um, I can try. Excellent. Um, so to calculate uh, the rate, I first found uh, where the 25th square would be. Um, and so I started off of here and I counted 25 squares forward. Um, so I got five QRS uh, complexes within that period. So I multiplied it by 12 and I got 60. Uh, I also did the large square method and I counted um, how many I got that way. And I got between 75 to 50. Yeah. Um, so, so it fell within good. that. That's excellent. That's great. So I'm going to stop you there. That's brilliant. You've done you've done exactly the right thing. But the key thing here is that because we can, oh because because these intervals are varying, um, it, the, the if you're going to use, if you're going to count the number of large squares, you you, you that's really appropriate when you've uh, when you've um, when you've got the uh when, when it's the same every time so you did exactly the right thing by count, by by counting the number of large squares but by counting counting the number of qrs complexes in five seconds so that's brilliant carry on um so the for the rhythm um i got irregularly irregular uh just because um we can see that uh it's um sorry irregularly regular um, and that's because we see that there's a deviation between um, the patterns here. So it'll go large, small, small, but it's doing that in a regular method. Yep. Excellent. So it's regularly irregular. Excellent. Well done. And um, uh, for the axis deviation, I got left axis deviation. For the one, it's a positive deflection, but for AVF, uh, it's more of a negative deflection. 
Yep. Excellent. Well done. Um, for the uh, PR interval, um, I had uh, prolonged because if I look at over here, the P going all the way to the start of the Q, RS, um, it's larger than three to five small squares. Good. Was there anything else that you noticed about the PR interval? Um, the, the PR interval. Um... You've done really well. You're absolutely right. It's prolonged. That, that's great. But did anyone else notice anything else about the PR interval in this trace? Is the PR interval the same? For every for every cycle, it varies. It varies in each lead. If you check yeah. the PR yeah. interval, it varies. Yeah. So the PR interval is varying. So if, I hope my cursor is projecting, but the PR interval here is a little bit longer because it's a bit longer than uh, than than one big square. Sorry, are you alright, mate? So it's a bit longer than one big square here, but here it's quite clearly a lot longer than that one, isn't it? So it's it's varying here. So we've got a little bit long, really long, a little bit long, really long. Okay, so absolutely, you're, um, you're quite right. It's a varying PR interval. Very good. Okay, so the PR interval, what, what else do we have? What are the durations to look at? Uh, the QRS. Yep. Um, the QRS was uh, normal. Yep. Um, it's less than three small squares. And then the QT interval was normal. Um, it's um, it, the duration was half the length of um, the QRS interval. Uh, from one QRS to the other QRS. Very good. Perfect. Very good. So full marks. Well done. Next one. Who's 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 gonna be brave next? Come on, someone someone someone's gotta be brave. Hamind Hamind has gone first. Um I can go. So on well done, Lauren. <laughs> it was tachycardia because the rate was um just over 150. very good um and i guess the rhythm is technically regular i think it's technically like ventricular tachycardia though okay so we'll, we'll come we'll come into what the we'll come in we'll, we'll come into uh, to, to to what the rhythm or the or the arrhythmia is but you're right it's, it's regular good um and i wasn't sure um about the axis because it seems like it is going like in both positive and negative directions in both lead mm. one. And Tricky, isn't it? Tricky, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah so do, do, do we think, so it's, it's sometimes it's hard to, in, in some cases it can be hard to tell what's the QRS complex and what's the T wave. But I think our QRS complexes are negative in one and positive in AVF. So what would that make it? Uh, negative. negative in one and positive in AVF that would be a right axis deviation very good that's right because it's going down and it's twisted even further out and it's going and it's going back uh going going back westwards if it's uh if it's if it's negative in one so very good right axis deviation so it's regular and fast and um uh, and with a right axis deviation okay what about the intervals um so for the p i p waves um correct me if i'm wrong um, yeah. And I thought that the QRS was wrong. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's hard, it's hard to see if there are any P waves, really, isn't it? It's um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty difficult to work that one out. So, what do you, what do you think about? Sorry, I, you, I think your, uh, your connection was cutting out a little bit. What do you think about the QRS duration? Are these QRSs narrow or broad? I thought they, they were broad, like over yep. 120. Yep, I agree. And what do you think about the QT? Um, I wasn't sure, <laughs> to be honest. It's, I, I, you know, I agree. And, and interpreting the QT interval when things are very fast is, uh, is, is a little unreliable. So I think that's, um, I, 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 I think that's absolutely fine. Great, four marks, well done. Two out, got two out of two. Nice one. Who's next? I can go. Um, very good. Okay, so the rate for this is, and this is bradycardia. Yep. It's somewhere around 40 to 50, somewhere around that. Yep. And then the rhythm is regular. Axis is um, left axis deviation. Looks like, um, mm. uh, no, okay, sorry. This is a normal one, sorry. 
Yeah. Yeah, so, this is a normal accident. So in, in, yes. in lead one, in lead one it's, it's positive, positive and AVF is also yeah, positive. Positive, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So it's only yeah, a little yeah. bit positive, but it is yeah. positive. So I think this is yeah. this is a, this is a normal axis. Yeah. yeah. And um, for the PR interval, it is roughly five small squares. Mm -hmm. That so, makes it normal, two hundred milliseconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Upper limit of normal. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, the QRS is somewhere around three small squares. Mm -hmm. uh, that also makes it within normal limits. Yeah, good. Uh, the QT is less than half of the R interval, which is again within normal limits. Mm, yeah. So as a, as, a, as a rough and ready, in it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's probably okay. I mean, if you measured the absolute QT interval. It's it, it's relatively long, but when you correct it for the rate, it's probably it's probably uh, it's probably close to normal. But so just like when it just like it being quite, it can be a little harder to interpret when the rate's very fast. It can also be a little harder to interpret when the rate's going very slow as to what's what's normal or not. Um, but yeah, that's great. Done good jobs there. Right, last one. I have a question. Yeah. Um, for certain ECGs, um, which lead do we prefer when we want to measure the QT interval? I always get confused with that. That's an, that's an excellent question. Um, and you know what? I'm not going to answer that question now. We're going to do a whole session <laughs> on measurement of the QT interval in, uh, on, because um, the Q, QT is something that's, that's going to be um, important for you guys. So I'm going to devote a whole session to that sort of thing now, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that now. Okay. But great question. Right. Last one. Who's going to speak up for this one? Someone's got to be brave. We've had three brave volunteers so far. Someone else has got to take a turn. Or I'm going to pick someone. All right, Anne, your turn. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm not exactly batting. Okay, for this one, I got I had question marks for the rate. I had I had put 38 and also 75. I don't understand why. I did this over a week ago, so I'm not sure why I had two. Okay. okay. Um, and I put that it was bradycardia. Okay. Okay. Fine. So how so how how are we how are we working it out? So so it. Let's let's uh, let's let's. So why why might it be thirty five or why might it be at thirty eight? So uh, well because I wasn't sure if that middle uh, like in lead one I wasn't sure if that was a QRS complex that one in the middle or mm -hmm. if it was not. Okay, so okay okay that's a great point. So a good thing is that for most ECGs, um, you're recording all of these leads simultaneously. And you have this one at the top. So here we've got lead two, but we've also got lead two all the way on here. And as you can see, all of these completely line up, don't they? So these are being recorded simultaneously. So sometimes in one lead, it can look a little bit tricky to work out exactly what's going on there. But if you follow it down, this is what's happening in all the other leads at the same time. And I agree, you'd, you'd be a bit concerned about what that was. But if you look down here, and if you particularly look down at the rhythm strip, I think we can be pretty confident that this is a QRS and this and this and this and this. Okay, so this one certainly looks a little bit different, but it is a QRS complex. Okay, so if we say that this is a QRS complex, what do we reckon the rate's going to be? Uh, 60? Yeah, yeah, roughly something like that. So if we're going to count it all out, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six QRS complexes in that um, in that 12 seconds. Um, so if we multiply that up, yeah, that's around about something like that. So it's a probably it's, it's a it's it's a roughly normal rate. Okay, good. Um, then for the uh, for the rhythm, I I put irregularly. No, sorry, regularly irregular. Excellent. I would totally agree. That's a repeating pattern there. So we've got these these beats, and then we've got a then every third beat looks a bit different. Great. And for the axis, I put uh, left axis deviation. Mm -hmm. now this I can't is, explain yeah. why because I don't have my notes now. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? 
Well, I, I think it. I, I think I think this is. I think this is good. Yeah. So if we look at the narrow beats, we're positive in one, and we're negative in AVF. So yep, that would fit with a left axis deviation pattern. Yep, I'd I'd agree with that. Okay, and then for the PR, and again, it was kind of hard, but for the PR, I put prolonged. Now, um, I'm looking at okay. The okay, it depends. I I think I think it's probably normal, um, but it's uh, probably at the at the at the upper end of normal. So if we look at, for example, here, we've got the start of the P wave just before that thick that thick line there and the qrs complex starts at least a whole small square before that thick line so i would say it's probably um, I, I wouldn't say it's any more than than uh, than 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 one large square there so i think the pr interval is probably about normal um, um for the qrs i have normal mm -hmm. so these ones are certainly normal what about these big ones you're you're right these one the, these ones are certainly narrow but do you think these these would the, these other every, every third beat? Do you think that's a normal or a broad QRS? Um, yeah, I guess. Broad. Long yeah. Long. So 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 you yeah you, you're absolutely right. So some of them and some of them are narrow and some of them are broad. Yep. Okay. And for the QT, I put normal. Yeah. I, yep. I would agree with that. Good stuff. Excellent work, people. Well done. Uh, so, sorry, Charlie, for this one, did you say that or was the rhythm um, uh, regularly irregular or irregularly re uh, irregular? I would say here we've got a we've got a pattern. We've got we go we go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I would say that this that, that in this case, it's 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 regularly irregular. I, I would I, I would I would agree with that interpretation there. Okay, great. So that's some, that's been a brilliant recap of um, of, uh, of what we did last time, and we're going to come back to the ECGs at the at the end of this session. So now, rather than just making some measurements, we're going to put these things into context and look at what these heart rhythms actually mean. So we look at rhythms and arrhythmias. So arrhythmias just means abnormalities of the heart rhythm. So as it's the, the context we're going to put these in. Is expanding on the things that we've done last time, we're going to ask some questions that is the, looking at cardiac rhythm that are going to enable us to put things into boxes to to, um, to to work out sort of what sort of what sort of rhythms going on here. Is there organised electrical activity? What's the rate? Some of these things are repetition of what we've done before. Are the complexes regular or ir irregular? Are the complexes broad or narrow? And if present, how is atrial activity related to ventricular activity? So you know how to work these things out now. And now we're going to now we're going to see what these things mean. First of all, is there organised atrial electrical activity? That seems like a funny sort of question because all of the ECGs that we've seen, well, of course there's organised electrical activity. That's what our normal. This, this is this is what our, our normal sinus rhythm looks like. And so we've got this is this 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 is what we've we've been looking at with all our intervals. We've got P waves, we've got QRS complexes, we've got T waves, and we know that from our physiology point of view, you're gonna we're gonna, you're gonna see this diagram again and again and again and again. This fits with impulses starting up at the sinus node, <clears throat> going through the atria, down through the AV node, through the his begin through the bundles of his and out to the Pekinchi fibers, and it gives us this nice normal pattern. So this is certainly organized electrical activity. The things I want to highlight here are that because this is a normal rhythm and because this is using the his Pekinchi system, this means that the ventricles can activate really quickly. Because the ventricles can activate really quickly, that's why you get a narrow QRS complex. The narrow QRS complex, it takes very little time from the start to the end of ventricular depolarization. So in a normal rhythm with normal conduction down the Hish-Pekinji system, we're going to have nice narrow complexes. And you'll see in a bit that that won't always be the case. But here, sinus rhythm, this is definitely organized electrical activity. What about this? Does this look like organized electrical activity? No, this doesn't look like organized electrical activity at all. This looks like just a bit of a wobbly baseline here. OK, so it's not an entirely flat line. In general, as a rule of thumb, if you see an entirely flat line, it means that the ECG leads aren't, corrected, aren't connected properly. But here we've got no P waves, we've got no QRS complexes, and we've got no T waves. Essentially, there is no heartbeat. This is not compatible with life. 
So the reason I'm going to talk to you about these things is not because when you're looking at when when you're looking at ECGs that you're likely to be asked to interpret an ACG of asystole. That's 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 not going to be the case. But the reason I'm showing you some of these things, these things is because we're we're really interested in things from an inherited arrhythmia point of view because these things lead to people dying and this is how people die. So one of the ways in which people might die is asystole, a complete loss of all ventri of, of all of all ventricular activity here. Everyone when they die is ultimately ends up in this state. This is asystole. If systole is a ventricular contraction, asystole means an absence of ventricular contraction. So here, if we've got our diagram of electrical activity, there's just nothing going on down here in the ventricles at all. Incompatible with life. So you could be rescued from this, um, but if this continues for any length of time, then you've got no blood circulating and, uh, and everything's going to shut down. It means the absence of ventricular activity. So asystole, you can still see P waves present. Okay, so here we've got some P waves, but they're not leading to any QRS complexes. There's, there, there, there's something that's stopping the waves of electricity from going through the, from, 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 from starting in the atria, but they're not reaching the ventricles at all. So this still counts as asystole because you're not getting ventricular contractions, but you still have P waves. And we call this P wave asystole, okay. So first question, is there any organized electrical activity? In these cases, no. What about this? This is another way in which people die. This is ventricular fibrillation. So here you can see at the start of the trace, you've got three beats that look like QRS complexes. I could buy those as QRS complexes, but as soon as that, but after that third beat, we've just got this wiggly line here. There aren't clear QRS complexes or P waves or T waves. It's just a chaotic wobbly line. This is ventricular fibrillation. So on our little diagram we've got down here, we can see that rather than this being smooth waves of depolarization going throughout the ventricles, instead the waves of electricity are going in little circles all the way around the ventricles as they're chaotic meandering wavelets of electricity, if you want to use a technical sort of term. Essentially, it means that rather than contracting in an organized way, all of the individual cells of the heart are trying to do their own thing. So they're all, all of the, instead of the, um, the, the cells contracting in unison or in a coordinated fashion, they're firing off randomly. Um, and it means that the ventricle essentially sits still and maybe quivers a little bit, but it can't pump blood. Once again, this is the sort of thing that is not compatible with life that needs emergency treatment. This is the sort of thing that can frequently be rescued by giving someone a big electric shock across the chest, what we call defibrillation. Um, but if you don't treat that quickly, then you're a goner. So once again, this is an important thing, not because you're gonna be asked to interpret this on an ECG, but, be but because of this is what happens to our patients if we don't treat them right. So first question, is there organized electrical activity? Second question, what's the ventricular rate? Well, you know, you, you know how to calculate the rate already. But to, give you an, but to give you an example, in our first example of, um, of, of sinus rhythm, we saw it at a normal rate. But you can get a sinus rhythm, a normal rhythm occurring quickly. So this is what we call a sinus tachycardia. Here we've got a ventricular rate. So the interval between QRS complexes is a little bit less than um, a little bit less than two big squares. So the rate's going to be a little more than 150 beats per minute. And things that can cause a sinus tachycardia will be things that you know for yourself. If you go for a run, your heart rate goes up and it occurs in a normal rhythm. You still got you st still starting in the in the sinus node, going through the AV node, down, down through the Hispokinji system. You still got P waves, QRS, T waves in a, in that regular repeating pattern pattern, but it's um, but it's occurring quickly. So if you're exercising, if you're in pain, if you're generally sick for another reason, if you've got a horrible infection going on somewhere, or if you've lost a lot of blood, or also or all sorts of things, if you're generally sick, that can give you a sinus tachycardia as well. And there's lots of other things as well. But in general, you can be tachycardic, but in a normal rhythm. If you see the if you see the standard P Q R S T, um, and that's a sinus tachycardia. Equally, you can have an, an a, a slow heart rhythm in a normal in in but that's sinus as well, a sinus bradycardia. So here we've got 
one, two, three, four, five, six QRS, six big squares between QRS complexes. Um, so the heart rate here is probably a little bit less than 50 beats per minute. So things that could cause a sinus bradycardia. So athletes typically have a resting sinus bradycardia. Um, so uh, even though we say that the normal heart rate is roughly 60, um, highly trained endurance athletes like pro cyclists often have heart rates in the, in the 40s or even below that. So it can still be a normal rhythm, but slow. Other things that can give you a, um, a, a slow heart rate, but in a normal rhythm include things like hormonal changes. So if you've got an underactive thyroid gland, it can do it. Um, if, you're, if you're very, very cold, so hypothermia, that can, that can cause it. If you've got changes in your blood chemistry, if you've got a very high potassium level, for example, that can start to cause things like this. There are lots of things that can cause it. Um, but again, it's, um, the, you can have a sinus rhythm that is again with a P wave, a QRS and a T wave that is, that, that is slow and we call that a sinus bradycardia. So we've looked at organized electrical activity. We've looked at the rate. We've looked at whether complexes are regular or irregular. So the big thing that we've got here, <clears throat> the, the big abnormal heart rhythm that's really, really common is um, that, that leads to an irregularly irregular QRS complex is something that's called atrial fibrillation. So we've got this word here, fibrillation again. So fibrillation meaning a quivering. We talked about that in, the, in terms of ventricular fibrillation before, whereas the ventricles that were quivering, in this case, it's the atria that are quivering. So the atria, we've got these meandering wavelets of electrical activity spinning around the atria. There's no organized electrical activity here. So you're not getting any output from the atria here, but the atria only con contribute about 10% to cardiac work and the ventricles do 90%. So this is still perfectly compatible with life. But because these are just spinning around, the AV node acts as a, acts as a bit of a break, a bit of a gatekeeper for the electricity getting down to the ventricles. So even if these atria, are, uh, the, the, the waves of electricity are spinning around super, super fast, the, uh, the AV node will prevent all of those wavelets from getting through and, and will, will mean that the ventricles will only act a little bit more slowly than that. It might be relatively fast, it might be at a normal rate, it might be very slow, but it doesn't permit all of these wavelets to get through. And because, it's, because it gets through the AV node and because it gets through the Hispokinji system, as long as the Hispokinji system is intact, in general, the, um, the, the QRS complexes will remain nice and narrow. So we've got irregular, irregularly irregular QRS complexes. We don't see any P waves because P waves are from organized electrical activation of the, uh, of, of the atria. We do see T waves. In this case, this is particularly what's called coarse atrial fibrillation. And so the, the, the baseline is really chaotic. Here. So it's hard to make out the T waves, but they are, they are in there, but we certainly don't see any P waves. So it's chaotic atrial activity with many electrical wavelets and it often originates from the veins that feed into the left atrium. And so there's, we can treat this with drugs. We can treat this with things called ablations. There are, there are all sorts of things that we can do, but it makes up, the atrial fibrillation makes up uh, a lot of the work of uh, electrophysiologists. So nice and nice common arrhythmia there, atrial fibrillation. There we go. Oh yeah, other things to mention. Um, because these atria are just quivering, the big concern with atrial fibrillation is that um, the blood stagnates in the atria. It's not moving through as quickly as it should do, which means that you've got a chance of clots forming there. So atrial fibrillation increases your risk of having a stroke and lots of people with atrial fibrillation will be prescribed a medicine to thin the blood to reduce the risk of stroke. And as we mentioned, the ventricular rate is dependent on the AV node. If the AV node is particularly slick, it allows lots of it allows more lots of those impulses through fairly quickly. So you get um, a relatively rapid ventricular rate. It may be a normal ventricular rate. It, you can even have a slow ventricular rate if um, with atrial fibrillation if you've either got a diseased AV node or if you've got um, or if you've given people lots of medication to slow down contraction through that AV node. Next question, are the QRS complexes broad or narrow? So this is something that we um, that was mentioned before. So um, Lauren talked about ventricular tachycardia. So this is what ventricular tachycardia or VT is. So let's look at this rhythm strip here. Here we are regular. We've got broad QRS complexes. We've got QRS complexes and we've got T waves, but we can't clearly see any P waves at all. 
And in this case, all of the QRS complexes look similar. So here, this isn't a rhythm which is originating from the atria and spreading down through the Hispokinji system. This is a rhythm where the electricity is starting in the ventricles and spreading out through the ventricles. So there are lots of different reasons why you can get ventricular tachycardia, but a common reason is if you've got a scar, an area of scar somewhere in the ventricles, maybe because you've had a previous heart attack, or maybe because you've had surgery on the heart before and then they've, made, they've had to make a cut in the ventricles. Heart attack's pretty common. Um, and the waves of electricity form a short circuit where they travel slowly through little channels that form within the scar and then quickly wrap around the outside of the scar and then go back in through slowly through those channels and round and round and round and round and round in a repeating pattern, spinning round and round the scar and through the middle of the scar and spreading out through the ventricles as you go. So in this sort of pattern, because the waves of electricity aren't using the Hispokinji system, which is, uh, which, is, which is optimized for rapid conduction, instead it's traveling through the, the it's traveling cell to cell through the, um, through the contractile cells, the cells that are optimized for contracting rather than speed of conduction. It means that it takes longer to get through the ventricles because it takes longer to get through the ventricles, our QRS complexes become broad. So that's why they're broad. The reason that we're not seeing any P waves here is because the, the, the atria aren't really involved. You might see P waves. You might see, um, you might see P waves occurring, uh, occurring um, uh, in, in, in a way that's completely unrelated to the, um, to, to, to the ventricles. It might be that the atria are going at a completely different rate to the ventricles if the, if the electricity can't get back up through the AV node. Um, but in, but in, in, you may even see that the electricity goes backwards through the AV node and the ventricles are the ones that are acti activating the atria. But in, in general, you're not seeing much in the way of P waves in, in a rhythm like this. So we're broad, we're regular, we're fast, and we're not seeing P waves. And that's all consistent with a monomorphic VT. So monomorphic, I've, I've spelt it wrongly, haven't I? That's rubbish, isn't it? Or a, a monomopric. That's not how you're supposed to spell it. A monomorphic VT. Okay. Monomorphic means that all the QRS or all the QRS complexes look the same. So um, this the it's often occurs in diseased hearts. And if it does occur in diseased hearts, it's often associated with people feeling pretty sick at the time. Um, this and this sort of thing can lead to a cardiac arrest, and you ought to take it pretty seriously. So in the context of the inherited cardiac conditions that we're particularly interested in, a monomorphic VT is the thing, sort of thing that's more likely to happen in diseases like um, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, so ARVC. That's the sort of thing that we would see that's more likely to lead to, to a VT like this. On the other hand, you can get what's called a polymorphic VT, where the QRS complexes vary in shape. So here, We've got something now. I want you to use the eye of faith here. I want you to. I want you to. I want you to try and picture the fact that the QRS complex is here, starting out relatively small and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and, smaller and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and, bigger and, bigger and, and smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's this sort of sinusoidal pattern of getting larger and smaller and larger and smaller, where every QRS complex is a slightly different shape to the one before. This is a form of polymorphic so um, multiple shapes of qrs complex this is one that's particular this this is this is a form that's called torsade de pointe okay and this is commonly associated with and uh, it's another form of ventricular tachycardia so it's broad and it's regular and we're not seeing any p waves there is organized electrical activity and this is and this sort of um, arrhythmia is particularly associated with things that prolong the qt interval so long qt syndrome or acquired causes of a prolonged QT. So things like um, taking medicines that have, art that have artificially prolonged your QT, uh, range blood chemistry, like a very low potassium level um, or various other things that can, that can, that can do it. So um, sometimes you can get polymorphic VT like this that goes on for a few seconds and then stops by itself. If that's the case, it's the sort of thing that tends to give people blackouts, but then people wake up. Uh, however, if this keeps on going, um, then uh, and, and, it, and it doesn't terminate by itself, and it ten, and then it tends to lead to cardiac arrest. And if you don't treat it quickly, then that's why people die. So this is what happens in long QT syndrome. Finally, how is atrial activity related to ventricular activity? Let's have a look at it. 
So sometimes our AV node doesn't work particularly well. <clears throat> and some, so most of the time in a normal sinus rhythm, every one of the beats that starts in the atria gets down to the ventricles. We saw earlier in the talk that in some cases, none of those beats can get down to the ventricles, which was leading to asystole. But there's a spectrum of things in between. So here we've got P waves and we've got QRS complexes. Every P wave is associated with the QRS complex, but you can see the P waves are pretty hard to see here because they're occurring right at the end of the T wave. And the interval between the start of the P wave and the start of the QRS complex is much longer than that 200 milliseconds or one big small square. So this is what we call first degree atrioventricular block, where it, the electricity can get through the AV node, but it takes a really long time to do so. And that suggests that the AV node isn't particularly healthy. In of itself, it's not particularly dangerous, but it suggests that something's amiss and that if, that if things get even worse than this, you could have problems. So that's what we call a first degree AV block. And this is why we measure our intervals. And this is what a prolonged PR interval represents. It represents um, a diseased AV node. If things get worse than this, we could have a second degree AV block. Some of the electricity is still getting through. We've got a P wave, QRS, T wave, P wave, QRS, T wave, P wave, QRS, T wave, P wave, nothing. P wave, QRS, T wave. So here you've got a relationship between your P waves and your QRS complexes, but not all of the electrical impulses get through from the, P, from the atria through to the ventricles. Sometimes it fails to conduct. And that's what we call a second degree AV block. So when we were looking at our rhythms before and we looked at things that were irregularly irregular, so if it was irregularly irregular, that tended to fit with a common cause for that would be atrial fibrillation. But something that is regularly irregular, where that, that sort of, that, that, that fits with something like a second degree heart block, where most of the time, or some of the time, the P waves can get through to the QRS complexes, can the, but every now and again, you drop a beat and you miss a QRS complex. So here, if this continued, you'd see a repeating pattern where you get three beats together and a gap, three beats together and a gap, okay? So that suggests that, again, your AV node is more diseased than it was in the first degree state. If things get even worse, you can get third degree AV block or complete AV block. And this is where you've got P waves going along and you've got some QRS complexes, but there's no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. The way that this works is that there are spots in the ventricle that can act as backup pacemakers. So the Hispokinji system does have some what we call automaticity enabling it to work as a pacemaker a bit like the sinus node but it works as a pacemaker that this work as a pacemaker is, is a little bit unreliable and it tends to be much slower than that of the sinus node so here we've got the p waves marching along here but none of them are getting through the av node and instead we've just got some backup pacing from occurring from somewhere down in the ventricles occurring at a far slower rate and this is really really super slow isn't it so in this sort of thing, people would tend to feel pretty unwell. And because that pacemaker is pretty unreliable, it can sometimes completely pack up. And that's what leads to asystole. And that's when people black out or drop dead. So AV block, atrioventricular block, these are, these are three examples of it. So here are some 12 leads of it. So once again, first degree AV block, we've got a one-to-one -one relationship between our P waves and our QRS complexes. But as you can see, if we look at this complex here, for example, we can see that there's more than one big square between the start of the P wave and the start of the QRS complex. Second degree AV block, we've got P wave, 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 P wave. P wave. We've got twice as many P waves here as we have QRS complexes. So this one conducts P wave QRS T, P wave, no QRS complex, P wave QRS T, P wave, no QRS. And we've got this repeating pattern where every other beat conducts, but every other beat fails to conduct. So this is second degree AV block. Here, we've got complete AV block. P wave, 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 P wave. And you can see here that there's no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. On this one, the beats that are conducting, you've got a fixed PR interval 
with all the beats that conduct. And that's more than could be expected by chance. There's, there's a relationship here. These ones are getting through. With complete AV block here, you might be tempted to think, well, is, are some of these, is that one getting through maybe? But I, but, but I don't think that's the case because there's the, the relationship, but there, there, there's no, there, 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 there's no uh, fixed timing between any of these P waves and any of these QRS complexes. The P waves are going at one rate, the QRS complexes are regular and going at another rate and they're at completely separate rates. Okay, so this is complete AV block. Okay, the final thing we're going to talk about are these pre premature ventricular complexes. Now, these are pretty important because these are the sort of things that you will see when you're interpreting ECGs. So here we've got a, a generally regular baseline rate, PQRST, but here, these beats are nice and narrow, but here we've got a big fat QRS complex that looks completely different to the other ones. This is what's called a premature ventricular complex or a ventricular ectopic beat is the other name for it. Essentially, that means where you've got another spot somewhere in the ventricles that's decided it wants to kick in a beat. It wants to act as pacemaker. It kicks it in in addition to the beats that are conducting through the, through the AV node and the Hispokinji system. So you've just got one beat here, which is broad, and it's broad because the electricity is not spreading through the Hispokinji system. It's spreading out from the ventricles and conducting myocyte to myocyte. So it doesn't conduct as quickly. It conducts more slowly. So this beat is broader because it's activating from down here rather than going through the Hispokinji system. The axis of this beat is going to be completely off. So if the wave of depolarization normally is going in this sort of direction here like this, if we've got, a, if we've got a, an ectopic beat starting here, the average wave of depolarization is going to be out to the side somewhere. If you've got an ectopic beat that originates down from the apex, it's going to be activating in an opposite direction to the usual axis. So you're often going to get a, a quite a different axis compared to usual and this broad beat. Second thing to notice is that there isn't a P wave preceding this beat, which is what you'd expect. There's no P wave because this beat is originating from, uh, from, from, from the ventricles. So it's a broad QRS complex of a different shape to the baseline rhythm without a preceding P wave. This is an important one for you guys to know about because when you're interpreting um, when you're interpreting ECGs, you will P, um, PVCs are a common phenomenon, and you will often see an ECG which has a PVC on it. This is not the beat that you're going to make your measurements on. You're not going to measure your QRS duration of this beat. You're not going to measure your QT interval of this beat. You're going to look at the regular ones that are occurring there. So you need to be able to spot where you've got a one-off beat that looks completely different, and you're, you're going to ignore that when you're making your measurements. Okay. So infrequent PVCs are pretty harmless, and they're really common in normal hearts. If you've got very frequent PVCs, maybe occurring every third beat um, or every fourth beat, then sometimes that can impair the heart function and sometimes that's due to diseased muscle. So again, if we put that in the context of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, one of the diagnostic criteria for ARVC is if you count the number of PVCs that occur on a 24 hour halter monitor. So ARVC is associated with high numbers of these PVCs. And if you're getting thousands and thousands of these on a 24 hour halter monitor, one possible cause for that, there are lots of other causes, but if you go, the one possible cause for that is some of the inherited areas and the things that we look at, like ARVC. If we look at how PVCs respond to exercise, other inherited conditions that we're interested in include things like CPVT. CPVT is, uh, so in general, PVCs suppress when we're exercising, but CPVT, one of the features of that is that these PVCs tend to come on when you're exercising, and it may even lead to ventricular tachycardia. So PVCs are certainly related to inherited arrhythmia syndromes and uh, are something that's worth being aware of and also knowing how to spot on an ECG. So this is an example of um, PVCs occurring not just once, but occurring every third beat. So we've got normal beat, normal beat, PVC, normal beat, normal beat, PVC. And you know that these are the abnormal beats because these ones are sinus beats. So we've got a P wave, QRST here, are QRS are the, the, these big fat um, uh, PVCs don't have a P wave preceding them, that axis is completely different. So here, unfortunately, we don't have one that's, uh, that, that, we've, that we've got on, um, on, uh, on, on lead one, but you can, you, can, uh, you can tell from the shape of them that, it's, that they're, they're rather different from the, um, from the rest of the QRS complexes that we've got. So 
now that we know a little bit about some of the common arrhythmias, there are many more arrhythmias to look at. We, we can make a whole career of looking at arrhythmias, but um, these are some, some of the common sorts of arrhythmias that we can look at. And these are some of the questions that we can ask that are gonna help us work out what the rhythm is that's going on. So going back to the homework ECGs that we had, and then we'll look at a couple more, looking beyond just the intervals and things, who would like to have a stab at telling me what rhythm is going on here? So let's start out. So have we got organized electrical activity here? Yeah, I can, I can see some nods here. So we've got organized electrical activity. That's, just, that's a good start. What was the rate? We said that the rate was maybe roughly 60 to 70 beats a minute. So it's, it's a roughly normal rate. What's the, are the QRS complexes regular or irregular? And we said that the, this was, we said that this was regularly irregular okay so that immediately makes us think this isn't going to be a completely normal sinus rhythm if it's regularly irregular the next question was are the qrs complexes broad or narrow i think we can agree i think we met, we, we, we said when we measured the intervals out that these were nice narrow qrs complexes is atrial activity present and how is it related to the uh, and how is it related to the qrs complexes well We've got P waves here, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave. In fact, I've helpfully marked them all out for you here. P, 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 P. So we've got regular P waves, but we've got irregular QRS complexes. So if we've got P waves here, trick question alert, if we've got P waves, is this going to be atrial fibrillation? No, this isn't going to be atrial fibrillation. That was a good shake of the head by Harminder. Excellent, excellent wordless answer there. I like it. So this isn't atrial fibrillation because we've got organized activity occurring in the atria. So can we use our intervals to work out what's going on? So we talked about how the PR, when we, when we talked about this trace earlier, we said that the PR interval was varying. This PR interval here looks pretty normal. This one here is getting longer. This one here, there isn't a QRS complex. Relatively short, longer. Unfortunately, we then drop off the end, but you'll have to believe me, it then misses again after this. So we've got this grouped beating hat pattern where every third beat misses a QRS complex. So what's the rhythm? Anyone want to shout out? First, first degree block. Hmm, good, good guess, good guess. But first degree block was a prolonged PR interval, but where every P wave, every P wave conducted to the QRS. And here, the first beat conducts, the second beat conducts, but the third beat doesn't conduct. There are more P waves than QRS complexes. So this isn't gonna be first degree AV block. So what It'll is it gonna second be? Second degree. Second degree AV block. That's absolutely right. So there is a relation between relationship between the P waves and the QRSs, but it's uh, but it's not a one to one relationship. You've got more P's than QRSs. This is second degree AV block, and this is a particular type of second degree AV block, which has got a funky name. It's called wanky back, where you get a progressive prolongation of the PR interval, and then you drop a beat, and then when it when it comes back again, you've got a it goes back to a shorter PR interval, gets longer and longer until it drops. And if you're feeling, um, if you're feeling, uh, if you if you want to see something silly, there's a YouTube video called the Wanky Back Song, which is with some geeky medical students who've made an who've, uh, who've made a song all about it in a Justin Timberlake style. So go and go and go and go and look it up, Wanky Back. Right. So our second ECG that we looked at. So can we explore the rhythm here? Uh, Lauren jumped way ahead and she gave us the answer right at the beginning of this when she was in, interpreting the trace. We talked before about how it was regular and fast with broad QRS complexes. Every QRS complex looks the same and we can't see any P waves. So what do we think the rhythm is, is here? VT, I think we VT, nice one, Brianna. Very good. Yeah. So this is ventricular tachycardia. This is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Okay. All right. What was going on here then? <clears throat> so we said that this was slow. 
we said that the QRS complexes were narrow. We said that the P, the, the, there's a, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes. The PR interval was at the upper limit of normal, but it was probably okay. So what rhythm's this then? Is this a sinus bradycardia? Yeah, this is a sinus bradycardia, absolutely right. So it's slow, but it's in a sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia. What about this one that, um, that, that Anne interpreted for us? Yeah, PVCs. Yeah, frequent PVCs. Absolutely. So it's regular and regular caused by frequent PVCs. Very good. Okay, let's look at something we haven't seen yet. What's this one? So let's go through it. So we're going a little bit quickly here. So we could we could we could work out we could work out the rate precisely, but it's probably a, it's probably about 110, 120 minutes, something like that. So we're going a little bit quickly. We've got organized atrial activity. We've got narrow QRS complexes. We've got a varying RR interval, so it's sort of medium, a bit longer, a bit shorter, medium, shorter, 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 medium. So we've got a, var a varying uh, RR interval, and it's occur and it's irregularly irregular. Can we see any P waves? Not really. You've got some things that you think might be a P wave, maybe, but then you look for the rest of the beats and you can't really see anything there at all. It's kind of a meandering baseline there really, isn't it? So it's a little bit quick, narrow QRS complexes, irregularly irregular, can't see any P waves, bit of a meandering baseline in between. What do we think the rhythm is? Is this polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? Good guess, but no. So polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So first of all, if it's polymorphic, the QRS complexes would need to all look different, but the QRS complexes here all look the same. Secondly, the QRS complexes are narrow, whereas with ventricular tachycardia, our QRS complexes are broad. So no, this isn't polymorphic VT, but good guess. So here, this is atrial fibrillation. This is irregularly irregular. And you can see that we, we've got the narrow QRS complexes so that we know we're conducting through the Hispokinji system, but it's irregularly irregular because that's chaotic electrical activity occurring in the atria. And that's why you can't see P waves clearly. And you get this irregularly irregular ventricular response. So that's atrial fibrillation. What about this one? Is this ventricular fibrillation? This is ventricular fibrillation. Excellent. Well done, Lauren. Yep. So this is a 12 lead ECG recorded in someone who's trying their best to leave this planet. Um, and so this is this is uh, this this is VF. So there are times where it looks like could could these could these be QRS complexes? But if you look for the rest of it here, this is just disorganized, disorganized chaotic electrical activity here. This is ventricular fibrillation. Very good. Okay, so um, that's it for today's session. That's a bit of a primer on arrhythmias, building on the, the stuff that we learned in the last session. So I'm going to send out uh, later today another um, another 